Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Safety Impacts of a Modified Right Turn Lane Design at Intersections. I'm Ryan Colton with the Illinois Department of Transportation and will be your moderator today. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. When you join today's webinar, you selected either phone or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in the upper right hand corner. There are two participate. You'll have the opportunity to participate in seven polls throughout the webinar. Please make your selection promptly and we will publish the results for you to see. You will also have the opportunities to submit questions to today's presenters by typing it into the questions pane of the control panel. You may type in your questions at any time and we will address all of them during the Q&A session at the end of today's session. So now for our first poll questions. And our first question is, how did you hear about the webinar today? Please make your appropriate response and click submit. Okay, looks like everybody's started to vote and we'll publish those results. So it looks like everybody, most everybody either got the, or heard about the webinar through the webinar, email invitation, or IDOT's website. Okay, so we'll close those. And the second question is how many people are joining with you today with the following options? Is it just you, two, three to five, six to eight, or nine or more. Please select the appropriate response and click submit. Okay, I think everybody's wrapped up here. And it looks like most people are joining in by themselves with just a few people joining in the same room together. Okay, so we'll finish those up. And on to our third and final question is what is your affiliation? Are you with Illinois DOT, the FHWA, local government, contractor, or are you a consultant? Please select the appropriate response. Click Submit. Okay, everybody voting. It looks like consultants and IDOT with uh, local government just about evenly distributed. Okay, we'll finish up our poll questions. Well, thank you for participating in the polls. And just one more announcement before we continue with today's webinar. As a benefit of your participation today, PDH certificates will be emailed to those who are participating today. At the end of the presentation, you can expect these in your inbox within one week. Talk a little bit about today's agenda. We've done welcome and introduction. Sean Coyle will be presenting first with background information and an overview, overview of modified right turn lane design at intersections. Carrie Shatler will then share her research findings through a discussion of research results on driver-based behavior and crash evaluation and causation. In conclusion, Sean will discuss case studies that were done in District 4 in Illinois Following the case studies, we will open the floor for questions and answers from the audience. During that time, please type your questions throughout the webinar and add comments to the, ch to the chat box. And now, I would like to introduce both of our speakers. 
Sean Coyle is a safety technologist for CH2M. He has recently retired from the Illinois DOT with 32 years of service, 22 of those years involved with the development of safety programs for District 4. With his safety background, he has served on road safety assessment teams throughout the state and chaired safety research for Illinois Center for Transportation on roundabouts and safety impacts on modified right turn lane approach. He is currently serving on NCHRP panels for the update of crash modification factors for the Highway Safety Manual and proposed human factors guidelines for road systems. Dr. Carrie Schaller is a professor at the Department of Civil Engineering and Construction at Bradley University. Dr. Schaller's specific area of expertise is highway safety engineering. Over the past 18 years, she has been actively engaged in research and scholarship, having authored over 30 papers in reputable journals, such as the Journal of Transportation Research Board, ITE Journal, and Conference Proceedings. Carrie has led research teams for projects sponsored by IDOT through the Illinois Center of Transportation, Peoria County Highway Department, FHWA, ITE, OSHA, Michigan DOT, AAA, and others. So thank you to both of our presenters, and I will now turn the presentation over to Sean. Thank you, Ryan. All right, uh, let me get started here. So let's, let's start with uh, why. Why are we doing this? Uh, with the background information. Uh, it, it began with uh, a few safety projects, and these safety projects all had similar characteristics. Uh, from 2006 to 2014, uh, we looked at 10 right turn approaches in the Peoria area, and we reconstructed or restriped them. And they shared similar characteristics, and the first is we tried to improve the line of sight for the passenger. Uh, vehicles turning right while still accommodating semi-tractor truck uh, turn radius. Uh, as a former uh, geometrics engineer, um, our background is, is we always design for the design vehicle. And in most of uh, our routes, uh, class two, it's the WB65, uh, now the 67. And one of the uh, characteristics is uh, we're trying to reduce the dominant type of crash uh, at, at these type of characteristics at these 10 intersections that they are similar to and share. And the dominant type of crash is the right turn on right turn crash. Now, it's interesting when we think, ah, that's usually a PDO. But interestingly enough, and then also looking at the crash data, there were several A crashes, B crashes. So people can and do get injured uh, severely with this type of movement. And as shown in here, uh, what happens is with the traditional design where we designed for the WB65, the driver with a large turning radius gets in a position where his head turn is so severe that he almost has to look out his uh, back window behind his column. And he needs to come to a complete stop in order to make that type of head movement while the next driver here at the stop has to look in this direction and, and cannot see the vehicle in front of him. So he proceeds not realizing, can only see in one direction, and unfortunately finds this vehicle stopped and rear ends. And that's pretty much the dominant uh, type of crash that we're occurring. So what can we do in the modification? Well, the first is let's put the driver where he can now see out of his front window, not behind, out of the back and then also is in a location where it's very difficult for another vehicle to store or he will see it already there when he makes his stop. So these minor modifications makes a huge difference on the crashes. And this, this began anecdotal. It was, okay, let's try this. And we tried this at uh, Prospect Avenue was our first location. And we got really good results. And then we tried it again. And again, it's all anecdotal. And then it was brought up, it's like, well, this is simple and naive looking at it before and after. What if we 
look to have this really studied and, and done right. And that's where ICT, Illinois Center for Transportation, uh, accepted this as a research idea. And Dr. Kerry Shatler, which we'll uh, be talking a little later, did the research and did it according to the, uh, the best practices and design and, and found that uh, it, it does make a significant difference, not just anecdotal difference. Okay, could we, uh, oh, let me erase that off the screen. As we talked about, what are the shared characteristics? Okay, I need to be able to advance. Okay. All right. Let's see. I need to have the. All right. Right now, I'm trying to get the, the control of the uh, advanced button here, but I'm going to describe it with this picture right here. Uh, the characteristics that all 10 of these intersections share is, one, they were designed according to our proper standards, and the standards are right. But the one thing that all of them share is a very heavy right turn volume and a very heavy through volume. And that's, that's probably the number one thing. And, and uh, the volumes, uh, a lot of these intersections, you, well, when you have heavy right turn volumes, a lot of these have right turn lanes. And then what they do with the right turn lane is they then create a, a island design, and the island design based on whether it is the degree of angle of the approach makes a huge difference. And what we kind of found with some of these intersections that as you, um, the angle of the approach changes from 90, usually you wind up with a pork chop that brings you in at about a 45. If we uh, have the approach angle at about a 60 degree angle and you, you put an island in there, your approach angle is now changed to 30. When you get to those type of angles, it seems like the crashes do increase exponentially when you have these shared characteristics of large right turn volumes, approach angles that force the driver to look near or behind his column, and uh, large turning radiuses. I mean, we design these turning radiuses for our semis, and we uh, need to be aware that uh, the passenger car then can use these and possibly then store in front of where we place our stop bars and resulting into... Um... Hi, Sean. Yes. Could you please just click on the presentation? Okay. Double click with your mouse. I'm clicking. Okay, Mark, can you just advance the slides for Sean? I, it's still locked on the uh, pin. All right, as we discussed, uh, design vehicles, class one and two, we designed for a WB65. Uh, we design according to our uh, uh, Okay, we got up to elements controlling design. All right, as... Sean, do me a yes. favor, go up to your grab tab and click on the highlighter and go back to your mouse. The pointer. Yes. Now you can click on the presentation. Mm-hmm. Okay, there it is. All right, let's get back to shared characteristics. What they all share, and then when you're looking at intersections that may have similar characteristics or a new design, is there a heavy volume of right turners? Uh, is there a large right turn radius? And uh, We designed for the large trucks. Uh, WB67 for our class two truck routes. 
but this also allows for higher speeds for the turning vehicle. And it also allows, and what our experience was, that it, with the larger turning radius, there's a larger length of curve that the stop bar is usually further back 30 feet or so from the intersection with a large turning radius. It allows the ability to, for vehicles to store in front of the uh, stop bar location so that the driver at some of these large turning radiuses, he follows the curb or, or is directed by pavement marking uh, around the islands, uh, finds that his head turn is in the 140 degree turn approximate area. And when you're starting to reach 140 degrees, you're approaching the column of the uh, car, which adds to blind spots. So the driver has to commit one direction looking. He either commits very early where he can look out the front and continues on, or he comes to a stop and tries to com complete this, uh, unable to see the vehicles ahead of him. So elements controlling design, there's really four basic things that we always do, and, and this is our policy, and this is, is uh, it's correct. It's, uh, in order to do uh, good design, we, we look at four fundamental things, and the first is a functional classification of our roadways. Class one and two are designed for the big semis, and we design according to their dimensions and access policies. We design by speed, and design speed sets what kind of sight distance do we want to attempt for that vehicle approaching the intersection to look down the road. And we design for the sizes and lengths of the vertical curves, within the intersections or the approaches uh, based on the design speed so for our stopping site distance, our intersection, and our decision site, site distance. These are all taken into account. We also look at our traffic volumes. We look at our capacity, and based on capacities, decide what type of traffic control we want to look at. And the customer. We design for our municipalities. We design with our uh, other governing agencies, schools, hospitals, neighborhoods, and of course we design for pedestrians, bicyclists, and ADA accommodation. But one thing, do we design how the driver actually sees the intersection? And that's, that's kind of what's becoming new in how we look at things. And one of the areas is human factor guidelines that has been developed as bringing a, a, a better understanding of how we actually see the roadways and what our limitations are. We all operate within a uh, certain parameters of being able to see our time to react and understand what we see, and then react with that, uh, and hopefully have enough room within there to have enough uh, reaction time to make a safe decision. I included this slide also because it was it was uh, from a uh, article by an RFA pilot that basically. Uh, kind of backs up what human factors are about, where he says, why I didn't see you. And some of the factors as they teach uh, a pilot how to drive so he can survive in a uh, uh, fighter pilot environment, it's also we need to understand we have these limitations also when we drive our cars. And one is our ability to see our peripheral range of vision. Outside 20 degrees, it's one-tenth our visual acuity. So as we scan, we need to be aware that if, if we're doing a quick look, we're, you're seeing about 1 20th of detail. And when we scan from side to side with our eyes, it's called cascades. It's kind of like a movie reel where there's gaps in how we see. And our brain fills those gaps in combinations of gaps, and we have just little fixation points as we turn our heads. And also the greater and the quicker that head turn, the more gaps we create. We also avoid the edges of the car's pillars, and that creates an even wider blind spot. So we need to be aware of how we see and what we're, the positions we're putting our drivers in our designs, the combinations of things. So the right turn lane design was modified to take into account how we see. On the left is the traditional of uh, design, and on the right are two uh, other uh, types of modifications. And as we talked earlier, traditional design, it's, it's to try to make that semi turn into the outside lane while we look more at how the driver sees. And then we also need to look at the need, do we have to put that semi in the outside 
lane if that movement is very, very light with semis? Or could we do something to keep him in that outside lane, perhaps do a, a mark out uh, as shown on the far right side where we kind of create a truck apron by pavement marking? The pavement's still there, we just mark it out and encourage the cars to the left side to improve their uh, sight lines. It's, it's interesting, and, and Dr. Kerry will talk more of that, is can we change driver behavior by simple pavement markings? So sharpening the flat approach, reducing the radius that the driver uses, whether by paint or actual physical curb, adjusting the stop bar location so it makes it much more difficult for another vehicle to store in front of you on that large turning radius, and modifying that corner island to improve the sight lines. And it has the added benefit This also serves uh, able to see pedestrians making these crossings a lot easier. So here's the uh, 10 locations we, we've uh, uh, modified in Peoria. And these are the ones uh, that were studied by uh, Dr. Carrie Shatler. And out of the 10, she did behavioral analysis for all of them, and she did before and after crash-based analysis uh, for seven of them. And with that, she was able to develop a CMF uh, for this type of modification. Okay, let's, let's go again now to some poll questions. So what's your job? Let's, let's open this up. Uh, could you please uh, select one of these uh, so we can get a better feel so who we're all talking to and, and how I can direct uh, some of my questions to you the best I can. All right, let's see uh, how we did, uh, the results. All right, we have design engineers, that's wonderful. So when I talk about different fundamentals, I think you're very familiar with uh, the fundamentals, how we design everything, and it, the importance of following our policies and standards, and uh, can we modify uh, some of those things uh, to better serve uh, the driver and make the road safer. And we also have some construction engineers, 7%, administrators, 7 and maintenance, 2%. Uh, that's, that's actually good for maintenance because perhaps there are some things that maintenance could actually, if they have a problem intersection, perhaps just with paint to make some minor corrections to better serve the driver making those turning movements. And when I do my case studies at the end, I, I think you, uh, you'll see that there may be some potential if you have these similar type of characteristics and similar type of crashes, right turn on right turn, that we may be able to correct. Okay. Okay, what level of experience uh, for modifying right turn lane design? I think uh, we, we can go ahead and, and, and answer this one. And also, I, I think experience also goes with you working with human factors. Is, is that a new term to you, too? Is, are you a beginner with that kind of concept? Is, uh, taking into account how we actually see and perceive the roadways. Uh, that is becoming a more and more uh, used term and, and uh, actually with uh, uh, design and with safety it is uh, expanding. All right, we're all beginners, so that's, that's good. Intermediate, uh, where some of the people here probably have some safety background experience and uh, work in that area. That's great and advanced. Very good. Okay. That's All right. Let's see if I can go to the next slide here. All right. Now let's see if I can get this to work. I'm sorry for the little bit of a delay. It's getting both these.
questions and slides to work together. All right. Now it's time to turn it over to uh, Dr. Carrie Shatler. Again, uh, when this was all studied, it was more anecdotal and uh, just kind of uh, observed before and after. And uh, what Dr. Carey was able to do was take it to the next level of uh, research, where it's uh, not simple and naive, but an actual uh, in-depth study and evaluation. Dr. Okay. Carey? Thank you very much, Ron, and it was a pleasure working with you and the ICT on this, on this research project. So today I'd like to share the results of um, first the, the driver behavior uh, evaluation and then we'll move on to the crash-based evaluation and then finally the crash causation analysis. So in this case, we focused on um, taking a look at all 10 of the study intersections, and we wanted to see um, what the geometric improvements, what impact those improvements had with the modified right turn lane design on driver behavior. And we focused on four critical variables. One is the exaggerated head turns, where you have a driver really kind of struggling to see that line of sight when they're in the right turn motion and right turn lane. We also looked at lateral placement of the vehicle within the turn lane to see if were they in the center, were they hugging the curb, or were they hugging the channelized island. We then looked at um, the uh, use of a roll and go stop. So this is a driver behavior um, we would want to discourage. So in these cases, a stop was required, but because of that um, turning roadway, a lot of drivers would just kind of roll through if there was a gap, even though a stop was required. And then we also, when a stop was required, looked at the position of the vehicle. Where were they stopping with respect to the striped stop bar? Were they stopping past? Were they stopping at or, um, or behind? And in this case, what we did, the, the vast majority of the intersections were already improved by the time we got on board with the study. So in that case, in order to do a before and after comparison of driver behavior, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't possible um, because we, once the approaches were modified, we lost the before period, if you will. So we had to go with a test and control uh, study design, and in that case, we wanted the control sites to be as similar to the paired test site as possible with the exception of the treatment, meaning we controlled for ADTs, we controlled for um, laneage and other geometric characteristics, but the control sites had the traditional right turn lane design, whereas the test sites had the modified lane design. We collected video data eight hours at each one of the sites. Um, we ended up with a total of 160 hours of data and over 19,000 vehicles that were observed. Here are the results for our critical variables. Um, essentially, we had three of the four um, critical variables that fell in line with our hypothesis. So number one, uh, compared to the control sites or compared to the traditional design, the modified right turn lane design experienced less exaggerated head turns, which is what we hoped for. There were less roll and go stops that occurred with the modified design, and drivers stopped um, past the stop bar less at the test sites compared to the control sites. The only variable where um, we didn't have a change that went per our hypothesis was lateral placement. So we found that um, drivers are still going to position themselves, and in this case, towards the the curbside or towards the radius um, to get appropriate lines of sight. Um, so in that case, we did have positive results that came out of the um, driver behavior analysis, um, which then we hoped to um, validate and confirm with a crash-based evaluation, which I'll move on to now. 
in this case, we did use um, only seven of the ten approaches because at the um, three remaining intersections, their improvements were made in 2014, which meant we, we did not have access to three years of after data. Because typically, you would want to have um, three years of crash data representing the before period and um, three years of data representing the after period at least. Uh, in this case, we used the empirical Bayes analysis um, to come up with the recommendations, to come up with, with the crash modification factors, uh, and our ultimate results. So in that case, um, we um, also needed a safety performance function in order to um, calculate the impact using the empirical Bayes method. And in that case, um, we, we thought it would benefit the project immensely if we could develop um, those safety performance functions. Essentially, those uh, safety performance functions are regression equations used to predict crashes um, and, again, required of the EV method. In, in that case, uh, we were able to not only uh, come up with these models for total intersection crashes and intersection injury crashes, but for our targeted crash type. So the, the very last bullet there uh, is our targeted crash type. That would be right turn related crashes at the subject approach. Because at our intersections, not all four approaches uh, were modified. In most cases, it was just one approach where the right turn lane was modified. And, and at another intersection, there were two approaches. So. Um, when you look at the overall total intersection, that's all crash types at all approaches. It, it dilutes the impact specifically of the countermeasure. So uh, we, were, we were quite pleased to be able to model um, the subject approach crashes, which the majority of them were right turn related crashes, but then our most targeted um, crash type. The models that we developed, we assumed a um, negative binomial distribution, which is, which is the norm um, for crash prediction models. And the variables that you see here, um, they arose uh, if they had a significantly um, re uh, significant relationship with crashes. So we didn't handpick these. Um, it, it's a result of the modeling process. So for total crashes, um, we can predict total crashes, uh, in, in our case, as a function of right turn approach ADT and intersection ADT. Similarly, for the injury crashes, they will have different coefficients, but the general form is the same. For the subject approach crashes, uh, the variables that were significant were, again, right turn approach ADT and speed limit. And finally, for our most targeted um, crash type, right turn crashes at the subject approach the variables that came up significant were head turn angle and right turn radius. So that's what, these are the equations that we used um, to predict crashes required uh, as a part of the EB method. And now just to the results. In this case, we see that if you look at the very last row, our most targeted crash type, um, we had a 59.6% reduction. And the, um, the expected would be analogous to uh, a before condition, but those are not the, the straight before numbers. Um, they're based on the EB method. The actual after numbers um, are listed there. So we went from 36.74 crashes to 15 crashes. Um, we had a very significant result there, as well as for the uh, subject approach crashes. Um, and then the other, we can see by looking at total intersection crashes and intersection injury crashes, uh, just modifying the approach did have an impact um, overall. Um, and those findings are significant at 95% level of confidence. Here, um, we weren't able to, uh, in this case, in this slide, we weren't able to conduct a, a, the EB method um, for older and younger driver analysis. Uh, so this is just based on, on the um, naive before and after. And, and the reason was, if you take a look, for example, at the older drivers. These are uh, average annual crashes um, aggregated for seven sites. We only had uh, 5.67 crashes at those seven intersections uh, that involved older drivers, um, which went down to 1.67. So here, we really didn't have 
adequate sample sizes to do regression modeling for these types of crashes. So we couldn't develop SPF uh, for age-related characteristics. But in any case, just you know, um, to make sure that things were operating appropriately, if you look, the first column is just all drivers. So that's the result of the um, naive before and after, 72% reduction. And these are all for the right turn related crashes at the subject approach. Um, so just comparatively, um, we, we were happy to see that this was really having old, helping older drivers um, as well as the younger driver group, because those are uh, groups that we're always concerned with in the engineering community. Going back then to the crash modification factors, um, you can see the percent reductions based on the EB method that were provided in, a, in an earlier slide, and then there we have the related crash modification factors um, for all the crash types. Uh, I will mention that for the total intersection crashes and intersection injury crashes, we have to view those results with caution because at uh, two of the seven sites, some other improvements were made, so we cannot attribute all of that percent reduction to the modified right turn lane. But at, once we get to the approach, that's really where we can. The economic analysis we performed um, ultimately uh, provided a benefit cost ratio of 13.8. So essentially, the um, crash benefits outweigh the cost of the improvements um, by a factor of nearly 14. Our, the third set of results um, that I'm going to present here really help to answer the question, um, you know, beyond just the seven or ten sites and the experience specifically that were happening there, we wanted to look at, on an area-wide basis, you know, what are the geometric or volume characteristics that are correlated with higher um, right turn related crashes. So in this case, we looked at um, 116 right turn approaches in central Illinois that were not the test sites nor the control sites. We analyzed um, 3,174 right turn related crashes over a four year period, and then we calculated crash rates um, and injury rates um, using the ADTs. We also obtained detailed geometric data um, and traffic volume data at these 116 sites by importing the aerial images into uh, CAD and then extracting all of the measurements like head turn angle, intersection angle, right turn angle, um, et cetera. And there in the graphic, you can see some of the dimensions and, and how we were doing that with all of the sites. So this provided us with a very large database. Actually, this is the same database that we used to develop the safety performance factors. Um, we then, uh, for this part of the analysis, did ransom statistical tests. We looked at comparison groups of two or three different uh, variables. We focused on the right turn approach location. So is that right turn approach in a right angle, in the obtuse angle, or in the acute angle? We looked at overall intersection angle. Was it um, you know, greater than or less than 75 degrees? Right turn angle, was it uh, greater than or less than 45 degrees? And the head turn angle, was it greater than or less than 140 degrees? And with those categories, where were higher crash rates? Uh, for right turn crashes happening. Ultimately, um, what we found is that there were higher crash rates uh, with approaches with right turn angles less than 45 degrees, with head turn angles greater than 140 degrees, intersection angles less than 75 degrees. Through our regression analysis, we, um, we determined that also we know head turn angle and right turn radius has a significant relationship with right turn turn related crashes. So from there, um, from the effectiveness evaluation of, of the sites as well as the crash causation analysis, that's how we came up with the modified design. And I guess the one thing I'll say is that it's not a cookie cutter design. I'm sure Sean will speak to this in more detail through the case studies. Um, but here we're trying to achieve the overall objectives of providing a better line of sight, putting the driver at a um, sharper approach angle and making the path uh, easier for passenger vehicles as well as trucks. We then came up with some recommendations. So um, in that case, if you know you have 
in approach with the you know one or more of the characteristics um, listed below, then it it would be a good candidate for the modified right turn lane design. Um, so in in that. Um, we now have some poll questions um, before we turn it back over to Sean. Okay, and we'd like to know what district you're in. So if you can please um, select your district, this, um, that will help us out. I guess even if you're not an IDOT employee, um, what general area do you do the most work in? Okay, and it looks like the majority are from District 1, um, but there is a good representation of, of all the districts. So that's fantastic. We have a second poll question, I believe, and this is a great question. <laughs> uh, are you a Cub or a Cardinals fan? Um, so those are the options, and I guess there's a, there's a neither in case you're supporting some other team that's out there. So if you could please take a minute, this is critical to our understanding of geometric design. Okay, and very timely, um, we have a lot of uh, Cub fans in the house. So go Cubs, I believe they're playing tonight. And uh, with that, um, we'll turn it over to Anquan. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Carrie. And one thing I really um, liked about Carrie's approach to the study was the behavioral aspect of it. And, and that kind of ties in with the human factors that if you can change driver behavior with your modifications and designs, that has the uh, desired effect to then follow with the changes and crashes. And it, it really worked out well here. Okay. So I'd, I'd like to go through uh, three examples. And, and the examples are all a little different. Um, the first example is an interchange off of 150. Uh, it is an urban park low, uh, stop control ramps. And uh, we mo the modifications we made, as we just talked about, uh, sizes of radius, it was a 60 to 30 uh, two-centered curve that we modified to a 65-foot turning radius. We also, on one side, we modified the island design, we changed the island location, and we modified the stop bar locations. The southbound ramp was all paint. It was uh, a 60 300 uh, two-centered curve modified to a 60-foot turning radius. Um, here's the before and after, the before on your left and the after on your right. So we'll start kind of looking at the, uh, the top one, the southbound. And on the southbound, here's our, our traditional type of design. And this location, very heavy truck volume, it's a ramp, so it, it, it does get a large volume of semis. It has the same shared characteristics, so large turning volume of right turners, large turning radiuses, and the skew angle of the approach. And it's interesting here that we come in at a 90, but we're putting our drivers in an angle like this. And we also have a large turning radius that they can store in this area. So just with paint, we were able to modify, and the existing stop bar was over here and the existing stop sign was here. So we're encouraging the vehicles to really hug the curb by placement of the uh, stop sign, stop bar, and um, the type of crashes we were seeing here were right turn on right turn crashes. So with the modification below, we were able to, just with paint and also relocation of the stop sign, we went with an additional stop sign here and here and moved the stop uh, bar up to encourage uh, the drivers to, to hug over to the uh, uh, 
left side as they approached it, and it changed their uh, sight lines as they looked out of the vehicle. They see out of the front of their window instead of uh, uh, behind their uh, driver column. And this is something that could be done by operations. Uh, if uh, you find a problem uh, type of intersection uh, in your district. Okay, let's uh, erase that. And now let's look at the uh, northbound and what we try to do here. Okay. On the northbound, we modified the island. We modified, again, with paint marking. We moved the stop bar up a lot farther. We also modified the stop bar up a little closer. And also had the desired effects and, and behavioral changes of our drivers. See here. Okay. Again, this shows uh, the before and after. Uh, the before the stop bar location was further down, about right here. And it also um, a very heavy. Uh, through volume, and this has a very heavy PM uh, right turn volume where they almost back out completely around this ramp. So uh, a lot of right turn and right turn type of crashes. Also, uh, we've also had some bad crashes where the driver uh, enters the through lane and gets rear-ended uh, coming down the S-150 hill. Shows below or the after where we uh, modified it both with island design and with uh, the pavement markings because again here we have a very heavy semi turning movement and with the higher speeds we didn't want to encourage the semi using both lanes we'd like to keep him in his uh, outside lane and we're able to accomplish that with the combination of paint and where we put them on the approach so let's Go on to the next. Next example is Douglas in Illinois 116. This is a stop condition. This location, the approach angle is at about 60 degrees. This is the after picture that you're seeing here. Uh, again, it's a 60 degree approach, so in it, we didn't want to make that worse by adding a, a modified island. We wanted to get it back to 60, and the main line was also on a curve, which contributed to the uh, severity of the head turn for the driver to see. Uh, Four-way minor stop control, uh, five lane, 45 mile per hour on the major. Uh, the northbound was modified. Uh, the right turn island, again, kind of rule of thumb, if you had a 60 degree approach and you have an island, it's going to put your approach angle at 30 degrees. Uh, a right turn lane was then added. Uh, this location in the uh, AM, it's a very heavy left going southbound, and it's a very heavy right going northbound in the PM. And most of these crashes were right turn on right turn uh, crashes, mostly in the PM when the DHV was very large. Uh, rest of the time of the day, very light turning movements, PM, so we could see a pattern of the combination of characteristics. Do you have a very heavy right turn? This had a very heavy right at certain times of the day when most of the crashes occurred. 75% of the crashes at this intersection were right turn on right turn crashes for all turning movements. So the right turn radius was reconstructed from 210 to 65, and in doing so, we were able to move the stop bar up and reduce the ability for a vehicle to 
make that uh, store in front. All right. This shows the, the before and after. Uh, the on the left with the uh, island design, forcing the driver in a uh, greater uh, angle, approximately 30 degrees, and it really made it a lot worse because uh, Illinois 116 was also on a curve, uh, also contributing to this head turn. In order to see, and I at each of these locations. I drove these locations, and part of getting a feel for what's going on is actually becoming the driver and a virtual driver at all these locations and seeing how the driver sees. So uh, when I drove this location, uh, I had to look out the, uh, behind the uh, column in order to see. After the modification and driving this intersection, I can see, even though it's a 60 degree angle intersection in the front of the column and the front uh, side window. So it made a huge difference and it also made a significant difference for this intersection on crashes. So this is a, uh, an example of the stop control for legged intersection. The last example is a signalized intersection and this is also our uh, uh, first location that we attempted to do where we just saw it's just a huge pattern of uh, right turn on right turn crashes. And because this was intersection was kind of on a diagonal, you know, the, the how it was entered, it, at first we thought it was northbound traffic because that's how it was entered, but it was actually the traffic coming off a prospect that was rear ending each other. This is the after picture, as you can see, uh, similar. It had, uh, we tightened it up, we tightened the turning radius up, and I, with each of these examples, and, and I want to emphasize that, to do a traffic count to really know what kind of vehicles are using your intersection. So uh, traffic counts were done and the truck volumes here were very light. Uh, Prospect Avenue uh, is probably mostly residential. It does have commercial on the uh, southern corner there. Um, but beyond that, it's, it's, it's residential uh, dominant. Uh, it used to be a state route. It was jurisdictionally transferred to the city. And since that time, it, it, it took on a more residential characteristic. So the need to have uh, a WB65 design stay in his own lane wasn't really necessary. So this was redesigned so that the semi can use part of the outside lane or inside lane and all of the outside lane when he completes his turn because it's a rare event. And that's allowed uh, when you look at the BDE manual, when you look at examples, they do allow those type of turning movements off of the minor roads onto the majors. I think they have a, an actual picture uh, within the BDE manual showing that type of movement. Uh, moving the stop bar up, moving the stop bar up in front of the left turn lane so that they could, the driver could still see approaching vehicles also helped. So those little things, each, each intersection is unique, traffic movements are unique, volume of traffic, types of traffic. So you kind of have to dig in to look at each kind of characteristic we have here. This also had a very flat before condition with a uh, island that forced the driver and I think even steeper than 30 degrees uh, in order to see it. I have to almost look out his uh, uh, back window and in doing so he couldn't see if the next driver in front of him made that stop. Uh, this has a very heavy PM uh, right turn volume. Uh, we were a little concerned about would we have backup problems now that we've slowed the cars down, slowed the right turners down for a signalized intersection, would they still clear out? And we found that the right turners actually clear out just fine as it was in the before condition, even slowing them down. And then perhaps we allowed them to see better to make their decision easier uh, to turn out versus where they'd get so far in where they become trapped and then they have to almost swivel their bodies to look behind them in order to see. So we didn't see a problem or a change in capacity with the modified design, which 
which was good. I mean, you have all these concerns when you're making uh, changes. Capacity is one of the fundamentals, and this is signalized, so we, we wanted to still make sure we stayed uh, with a similar level of service with this modified design. And accompany the dominant types of vehicles and reduce crashes. So with that, um, that's my part of the presentation. I guess it, just to summarize, I'd just like to say it's, it's they share similar characteristics, but the most fundamental thing is learning to see how the driver sees and trying to keep them out of positions where it makes them harder to see and make their decisions to proceed ahead where they can only see in one direction at a time or give them room where they can make mistakes by storing beyond the stop bar and, and taking away certain things where they can make mistakes in. So um, I hope uh, uh, you got something out of this uh, to assist you in your uh, future uh, safety endeavors and design endeavors and would like to both Carrie and I open this up to questions. Okay, thank you Sean and Carrie for your presentations today and not only your presentation, but your hard work and dedication to this research project. Um, before we get started with the question and answer session, I'd just like to encourage you um, to register today for the next two webinars in this series. Also, all webinars in this series will be available for on-demand viewing, and the link to the recordings will be sent out to all of the attendees. Uh, next one is coming up on Tuesday, November 29th, and there's a registration link here, but one will be emailed to you as well. <clears throat> and in December, that's Monday, December 12th, there will be a pavement marking selection and installation inspection in upcoming as part of this webinar as well, webinar series. Okay. Um, so our next session here is the question and answer session. Um, if you have not done so and you have a question, please submit your questions in the poll pod, which is found in the upper right-hand corner of your GoToWebinar control panel. <clears throat> and we have some questions coming in here. I'll just start in the order that they were submitted. Uh, first one is for Sean. Uh, Sean, the question is, what volume of right turns is considered high? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Carrie did touch on that. She said, it, uh, and I think using these 10 examples, uh, they were in the 250 DHV range. I think also as a guide is uh, the BDE manual, chapter 36-3, that uh, shows when a right turn lane is warranted. So if it's a new design and you're kind of questioning it, um, I, I would use those as guidelines. They start to enter in because they use the combination of both the turning movement and the through movement and making your decision, uh, which has an influence. And it is, it's, it's a uh, combination of the through traffic and the right turn traffic interacting with each other. So I would say 250 is what we experienced and had our best results, but I believe if you're in the 150 range or using the BDE Chapter 36 as a guide, uh, that, that could really help you out. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, next question is, Will this design require a policy variance? The island design and pavement marking is different from what is shown in the BDE. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, BDE uh, traditionally stripes, or, or pavement marking, we traditionally stripe around islands and in a way that kind of encourages the vehicle to be moved over uh, to complete his turn and puts, possibly puts him at a, a harder, uh, sharper angle to see out of or, or where now he's, he's increasing his head turn. Uh, I, I think that um, 
policy is looking at this to see if these modifications are, are possible. But also, I, with anything, with your documentation of why you do something that isn't quite uh, um, by the uh, book, if you have a um, modification like this is that's done for a specific reason and with this research it's documented that has a positive result, I think uh, you could uh, make these modifications. Uh, either handle it at a uh, bi-monthly or something of that nature. Uh, but I, I believe that uh, uh, policy is looking at uh, a few modifications to the BDE um, with this research results. Okay, thank you, Sean. Next question is, at stop controlled intersections, do you always design for the truck movement into the outside lane? Is there any scenario where design into the inside lane would be acceptable? Okay, um, again, uh, there are uh, drawings in the BDE that do show uh, from the minor movement that both lanes uh, are uh, acceptable to turn into. With everything, it's a case by case. Uh, and here we, we showed you two examples. When you have a higher speeds and higher truck volumes, we like to go with the painted out uh, truck apron. And it's interesting, uh, you know, when we stripe out around islands, semis know to go into that striped out area so that their back wheels don't go over the curb. It's, it's the cars that uh, we're getting in trouble. So by encouraging the semi front cab to go where we want them to, along with the cars, the outside becomes just their apron. So um, by policy and, and by what's shown in the BDE, it does show uh, off the minor that if there's two lanes, they can use both lanes. It looks like it's half of a lane and the full outside lane. And then also, case by case, look at what you have. If you have high speeds, high truck volumes, possibly look at a apron design. Excellent. Thank you. Next question, I believe this is for Professor Shatler. The question is, how do you think the results of the behavioral study being test and control would compare to a before and after comparison? That's a good question. Um, actually, I, I didn't have time in my uh, presentation to, to present you know, all, all of the research we did, uh, but actually because of the timing, there were um, three sites, three of the test sites that were implemented while we were studying um, and, and evaluating the driver behavioral component. So we were actually able to get um, before and after data on driver behavior characteristics at those three sites. And um, in that case, the results came, came out exactly similar uh, in terms of the overall statistical conclusions Is that uh, for the test and control. So essentially that kind of validated the test and control and that one is typically more well received just because of the number of intersections or the amount of data. But we did do um, at a few intersections some before and after comparisons so that supported uh, the test and control. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. I have a proposed intersection in design with approximately 70 degrees intersection angle. How do I know if this will be a problem intersection? There is no crash data to see if problems will occur. Well, uh, that's the uh, the biggest thing is, is looking into the future. And what I look at first, uh, the characteristics, is is there a heavy right turn on right turn volume? And that could either be all day or it could be like an AM or PM DHV. And if this, vi <clears throat> and if when you're doing your design, um, your IDS, you should have that data um, estimated so you could first answer that number one question, do I have a heavy right turn on right turn volume? And then 
will I, by my island design, put this vehicle where he has to, where the stop bar in relation to the vehicle location, have to look beyond his uh, door column. And it's, it's, it's one of the things, and that's our, our, our challenge, and I think that's, that's the next step is, is not design how we see it on paper, but design how they see it uh, when they're in the field, or when they're at the driver is actually driving it, I should say. And um, we have done some modifications. We had, uh, I didn't show it here, but uh, in District 4, um, there was a intersection on 91, which was used to be a tight curve with a intersection on the high side of the curve. It was totally reconstructed. The city brought another side uh, road street into it. It's now a four-legged intersection. <clears throat> the curve is gone, but that turning movement is still there, very heavy in the PM. So we went with a stop control intersection and we knew it was going to be very high volume in advance and we knew we'd have semis on it. So with that, we went ahead and uh, did it, painted out um, kind of a truck apron next to the uh, island design. And just observationally, because I, I, I think what Kerry showed, both observationally and crash, is if he can change driver behavior, are they moving over? Are they use, moving over because of the striping? And in this location they are, will that have a positive impact? And, I, I believe it is for this intersection. Uh, it was put in two years ago, so I don't have after crash data, but it seems just from behavior uh, we're getting the desired results. So DHV, of what your right turners, is number one. And then on paper, if you can, look at the angles, look at, uh, according to the main uh, mainline speed, what is the intersection site distance. And if you draw that in and that driver uh, at the stop or near it, has to see beyond 140 degrees uh, from his direction. He's probably having to look through the driver column. And is there something you can modify uh, to make that one of the driver column? Okay, thank you, Sean. <clears throat> Next question is, I believe, to Professor Shatler. Did any of the research account for inclement weather like snow drifts from the strip islands into the turning lane? Within looking at the crash data, um, we have a, a pretty massive uh, database of all of the pavement condition, um, you know, driver age, all, all kinds of different details, con um, contributing factors, maneuver types. Um, we could go back and look at that specifically um, but we didn't pull it out and analyze, for example, was there an impact due to um, crashes happening during inclement weather. It could have also could also be a function of um, the weather in a given year. Just you know, from my memory, I can't recall all the before and after years, but I know some winters were mild, um, other winters were uh, very harsh. So that could also possibly influence the results. Um, we have the data. Uh, we just um, didn't notice any predominant um, causes being specifically, you know, it's not like when we were analyzing, we said, oh my gosh, there's a ton of, of crashes involving inclement weather. Had there been, we would have pulled it out um, because it's very easy to notice when you're, when you're going through the data. But it's something we certainly could look at, but we haven't done yet. Okay, thank you. The next question is, the Illinois rules of the road requires that drivers turn into the nearest lane, the outside lane for right turn. With modified right turn lane, drivers would typically be turning into an inside lane, correct? Follow-up question is, do the rules of the road need to be modified accordingly? Well, for passenger cars, even with the modified uh, design, uh, the modified radiuses were in the 65 uh, range. I think the tightest we put in, that was prospect, was at 45 degrees. 
So it's still possible for cars and trucks to turn into the right side, into the outside lane. It is the semis that have to swing wider and make that turn. And by the example in the BDE manual, from the minor onto the major, uh, they do show a I think a single unit utilizing off of a city street, uh, utilizing both lanes. So I don't believe it's 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 necessary. It's it's also uh, case by case how we did these that we wanted to find the right balance of safety, uh, and we when we saw the crashes and the predominant crashes are passenger cars, we felt it's safer. Uh, to modify the design and they can still make the right turn into the outside lane if there's two lanes out there. It's, it's really, the modification is mostly the semis and how we treat the semis and it's based on speeds and, and volumes of semi turning, whether it was done with a truck apron painted out or that we went with uh, the wider turn. That did encroach uh, halfway into the inside lane. Even doing so, we haven't seen any increase in crashes for semis um, at any of these locations in the after results. I hope that answered it. Yep. Thank you, Sean. Next question is: Did you have? Excuse me. Did you have to obtain design exceptions to make these geometric and striping modifications? Uh, the IDSs uh, all went through bi-monthlies uh, when we did them. I did not request a design exception uh, because the, it allows a semi to use a lane and a half uh, in certain instances. Um, the uh, others where it was by paint, I, I didn't use a design exception there, but it did go through uh, bi-monthlies. They were reviewed and they were accepted. Okay, thank you, Sean. Next question is, what pedestrian modifications are recommended for the stop bar location modifications? So I'll ask the, I'll state that again. What pedestrian modifications are recommended for the stop bar location within the right turn lane modifications? Well, that, that's a good question too. You still have to accommodate the pedestrians and the bicyclists. Um, the flatter angle coming into the uh, intersection actually helps serve pedestrians a little better that uh, if we can move the stop bar closer to where the crosswalks would be, uh, we have to do the balance of crosswalks and uh, uh, stop our location and sight lines, but with the larger turning radiuses that we had before, uh, it makes it more difficult to see a pedestrian. So I think it helps uh, accommodate as as a side benefit uh, for pedestrians to be seen. Um, I didn't have it in the examples, but Northmore is one of the uh, major bike crossings on the Rock Island Trail. We modified that island and also the turning radius. Uh, and it, 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 uh, we brought it in at a uh, better angle uh, and we're able still to get the, uh, the, the crosswalks in by policy where the stop bar is still four feet away from the crosswalks um, and we were still able to move it all up further than what it was previously. Thank you. Okay, the next question is, did they find an increase in the mainline rear end crashes with cross street right turns due to reduced acceleration entering mainline from cross street? Okay, I think, I think that question is looking at, so if, if, if I'm correct, my assumption, um, is you're talking about a crash with a, a right turning vehicle um, and a, a far side through vehicle from the opposing direction. Uh, that was considered that type of crash there down 
um, on the far side of the intersection was considered as one of the right turn related crashes. So we actually um, overall saw a decrease in the after period. So the rear end type crashes mainly were, were that one, um, a right turning vehicle with you know, an oncoming through vehicle, and as well as rear end um, crashes occurring in the right turn lane. So I hope that answers the question. We saw a reduction in, in all of those. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next question is, did you look at the intersection between the vehicle location and pedestrian locations? When changing the angle of the driver, it seems that pedestrians are outside the vision of the driver. I would have to say overall um, with respect to pedestrians, so first of all, at our locations, um, we didn't have any pedestrian crashes. There are very low pedestrian volumes at, on these um, state routes and at these locations. However, uh, many other city intersections, um, for example, in Vancouver, they're looking at um, sharpening the flat approach angle for right turns to reduce the impact of a driver, you know, being on a flat approach angle and constantly looking to the left uh, for a gap. So with the traditional design, I think that would be more um, to pedestrian crashes. So um, even in the literature, um, you know, sharpening the approach angle will help with pedestrian-related um, incidents. Yeah, and I'd just like to follow up that um, that island where we uh, design is actually very similar to what I've seen in uh, uh, for pedestrian countermeasures, uh, where they uh, modify the island design just for pedestrians to change the approach angle f uh, for the cars so the cars can see them better. And it's it works also for the uh, car to see right turners also or uh, that we found for reducing right turn crashes. Okay, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Professor Shatler. I believe that is all the questions that we have so far. Um, one housekeeping question. I just wanted to reiterate that uh, um, if you were registered and, and attended the seminar today, you will be getting a PDH credit, and it will be emailed to your inbox within one week. So you should be seeing that uh, at least within one week. And so with that, I think that we have answered all the questions. Thank you for attending the webinar today. If there aren't any more questions from our audience, um, thank you for attending. And with that, uh, we will, that concludes today's webinar. So I want to thank everybody for attending.